seem to have agreed upon terms that are close to persuading Rodgers to return. Green Bay did a very smart thing because there were other teams that would have been interested in trading for Aaron Rodgers despite the Packers saying we will not trade him. I'm surprised that it's taken this long, but look, they were able to put a band-aid on the situation. He wouldn't have flown in if he didn't think it was getting done. And this is going to continue to be a distraction. The eggshells that they're going to be walking around and going, okay, is the quarterback ticked off? While there are some people that appear to be upset with the way Rodgers has handled this, it looks like he will have the support of most fans, if not all of them, when he does come back. Oh, we have an update, folks, and your girl's fired up. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into First Take. I have on my Packers green, Freddie Coleman, huh. Sam Acho, Dan Orlovsky. I am crewed up. The boys are still off. Fellas, how we feeling? We ready to We're do ready. this? We ready. Okay, We're ready, Moss. Let's go. Breaking news. The plane has landed. After 89 days of asking the same question every day, Will Aaron Rodgers return to Green Bay? I have a concrete answer for you. He will, and he has. Earlier today, he arrived at the Packers facility. Rodgers is back with the Packers, but it wasn't without concessions. Both sides are hoping to finalize the agreement shortly. Acho, let's go. Uh, who won the standoff? Is it Rodgers or the Packers? Well, there's no doubt that Aaron Rodgers won this standoff. This dude literally went through social media. He went through his fiance, his teammates. He didn't even have to say a word, and he still won the standoff. Aaron Rodgers got exactly what he wanted. The last few years taken off of his deal, the freedom, the control, the decision to make uh, decisions on the roster, everything that Aaron Rodgers wanted, he got. And so, yes, Aaron Rodgers, hands down, won this standoff. No shot. <laughs> Absolutely no shot. This is an absolute home run by the Green Bay Packers. I'll take everybody back to the moment they drafted Jordan Love. I guarantee you their intention was, we are going to sit him for two years, let Aaron Rodgers continue to be our starting quarterback, and we will trade him after the 2021 season. All they're doing right now, as of today, is making it look like they're meeting him somewhat halfway. They get to have their cake and eat it too. This is a football team that gets the con or organization that can groom their young quarterback, sit him on the bench till he's at least as close to ready as possible behind the MVP, while also keeping the MVP. And Sam, like, listen, I beat up on your brother on television a bunch, and I, I, I'm sorry I have to do it in the first five minutes here. He didn't get what he wanted. Do you do wanted. it in real life, though? He didn't do you get do it in it, real life, though? He didn't get it what he wanted because, in his words, he wanted out of Green Bay. Or is in his camp's words, he wanted out of Green Bay. And that's not the case. And even, they took one year off of his contract, potentially. He gets to, or they get to, review the situation at the end of the year. They very well could this time next year say, you know what, you are the MVP again. You're the back-to-back -back MVP. And we went to the NFC title again. We're not going to trade you. You're still under contract with us. And we aren't going to move you. He also doesn't get total control. He gets, according to Shefty, likely some say of where he can go, but he doesn't get total say. This isn't Tom Brady of two years ago where he was a free agent and he gets to hand choose what team he was going to. There are going to be stipulations on where he chooses to go. And we don't know what the front office and the relationship is going to be like because they could very much say, you know what, we'll trade you to a team that isn't good and isn't a Super Bowl caliber roster, whether you like it or not, just because we still have control. This is a home run by their general manager, Brian Gutenkust. Aaron Rodgers, this feels like a relatively big swing and miss. No, Dan, it's a big swing and miss by you because there's no way that this is a home run by the Green Bay Packers because in the National Football League, Aaron Rodgers did something that plenty of other players have always wanted to do, not being free agents. That is dictate the terms of your exit. I told people he's going to play one more year for the Green Bay Packers. Then after that, he was going to make sure he's going to be traded away from that organization because he does not trust Brian Gutenkus, the general manager, and he does not trust Mark Murphy, the president. The fact that he was able not only to come back for one year and thumb it in their face. Now, for Green Bay, 
if he wins a championship, then everybody's going to benefit. There's no doubt about that. Not just the organization, not just the fan base, not just the players. But Aaron Rodgers, by not saying a word and letting his camp do all the work, got what he wanted. He wanted to play one more year in Green Bay, and then he gets his behind out of there, no. and he can play somewhere. Yes, yes, yes. No, there's no no here. There's a yes, yes in this situation because Green Bay did not recognize their power, Dan. They had this guy under contract for three years, over $14 million this year, $25 million in 2022, and $25 million in 2023. They could have restricted his movement and say, you either play for us or you retire. And Aaron Rodgers said, no way. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to get out of here in Green Bay, and I'm going to come back for one more year and then go by the wayside. You want to say that's a swing and a miss for Aaron Rodgers? Aaron Rodgers is not in a swing and a miss situation coming off an MVP Friend. season. And if he gets the team back to the Super Bowl again, who is, how is that a swing and a miss for Aaron Rodgers getting what he wants and then getting out of Green Bay because he doesn't want to be with this organization anymore? But, Freddie, the, the, the comments on draft day out of him or his camp were he doesn't want to play for the Packers anymore. Like, he wants out now. It wasn't he wants to play one more year and then get out after the 2021 season. He did not kind of miss minicamp, miss mandatory uh, minicamp in offseason, potentially miss training camp to not play this season. He didn't do that to try to get out after this year. He did it because he was making it clear he did not want to play this season with them. And the Packers just stuck to their plan. This goes back to the drafting of Jordan Love. This was always their ideal situation. The Packers get to the, have their ideal situation. This is not the ideal situation for Rodgers. The ideal one was he was going to be traded before this season started. Dan, that's Dan, ha- that's Dan, his Dan, words. No, Dan, it's not an this, ideal this, situation because we don't know what Jordan Love Packers, can do. No, it, the, it has nothing to do with the Packers because here's the deal with the situation. If you think it's an ideal situation for the Packers, would have been if Aaron Rodgers come up a 7-9 season, then you can say, hey, Aaron Rodgers, we're going to move on Jordan Love and we're going to cut you out of our contract. That's an ideal situation for the the Green Bay Packers based on organization and what you just said. This is not an ideal situation because they did not think that Aaron Rodgers would be an MVP at this point of last season. Right. They were hoping that Aaron Rodgers was going to be in the downside of his career and now it's blown up in their faces and they didn't know what to do. They were spinning around trying to do everything and nothing worked every time they opened their mouth in that situation because Aaron Rodgers had them on skates and had them under control not recognize that Green Bay Packers had him under control and they let the control get away. Freddie, let me level set. Let me just level set real quick. So so, Dan, you're talking about this is an ideal situation for Green Bay. They only have their star quarterback, the MVP of, this, of the NFL, three-time MVP, Super Bowl champion. They wanted him for another three or four years. They only gave him one. That's not ideal, number one. That's not a win, number one. Number two, look at the way – just, just watch the film, right? You love watching film. You love breaking down tape, right? I love it. I respect it. Look at the tape of Aaron Rodgers coming in on his private jet. Look how happy he is. Look how relaxed he is. Got the hair in the bun. Got the smile. Everything going. He is, that's not a loss. Look at this dude. He's laughing. He's joking. Got the shades on. This dude is chilling. This dude literally looked in the ownership's face and got exactly what he wanted for them. Now, not to say it's a loss for Green Bay. Green Bay should be happy. Yes, they got their star quarterback back. But just to your point, Dan, you talk about what's been coming out of Aaron Rodgers' camp. I don't want to play in Green Bay, et cetera, et cetera. Dude, it's called negotiation. This is literally the art of negotiation. You say you don't want to come. You say you're going to sit out. You say you're going to do Jeopardy. Then all of a sudden, you get exactly what you want. And so just want to push back a little bit of saying what what he he, he wanted. He he wants to play. He's getting his guys back. He's got control of the roster. He's starting to decide who's going to be on the team and who's not. And oh, by the way, to your point of people reviewing after this year, right? It's not like... He, why would he sign a deal that says the Packers have the opportunity to review? All that that review period means is that if Aaron needs to leave, he can go. This dude is not upset. He's not confused. He's not frustrated. Okay. Aaron Rodgers has exactly what he wants, number one. And number two, the Packers, to your point, should be happy. They have their quarterback. But why would they not want their MVP for another two, three, four, five, six years? Because, not Sam, they drafted a kid in the first round to replace and, him last year. And that kid in the first round hasn't been what they've expected. Otherwise, exactly. they would have been totally okay. So they That's get fine. the so, first-round quarterback. They don't have to rush him on the field. They can continue right. to develop him while also having a Super Bowl-caliber roster led by the MVP. How how is that the organization not getting the ideal situation for this season? Question. What, happen, what happens if Jordan Love isn't ready after next year? What happens then? He's going to play next That's year. Not, exactly. what, what, just what happens if he's not ready? Well, you what know happens if Aaron Rodgers has I, another MVP I, season? And, yeah, and the Packers please. will still control his rights. 
there is whether we say the review period is a mandate to trade or not. Mike Tannenbaum said it this morning. He's been in front offices. I haven't. They can still control his rights, whether they say it to him or not. They can still, at the end of the season, go, wait, we went to the NFC title game. Do you want to come back? You had another MVP. They can still say you're under contract. They can fire their general manager, and the new general manager can come in and say, dude, you're under contract. We are not trading you. We will force you to retire and go back to the same situation we just went through. Here's the deal. And you know what will happen if that happens again? Aaron Rodgers will win that again if that happens, right? This, so, 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 Dan, let's just, let me just, just let's just kind of take it back a little bit further, okay. right? Aaron Rodgers, star quarterback, yeah. premier quarterback, the man, the myth, the legend, right? You watch quarterback play, you understand power, you understand what it's like to be the guy on a team. This dude has a different kind of uh, swagger and bravado and a type of uh, uh, weight that he carries when he walks into a room. Not any or very few quarterbacks, people in life, have that kind of bravado. This dude literally wrapped the entire media industry around his finger, including his, his fiance, who's doing her thing and helping tweet his stuff out, including his teammates, including Darius Smith, including Devontae Adams, and got them to, without even saying a word, without even saying a word, got what he wanted. You're saying that he didn't get what he wanted because he, quote unquote, said that he didn't want to stay in Green Bay. What I'm saying is it's called negotiation. This dude literally said one thing. Wanted. Yes, I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he negotiated to get exactly what he wanted. Get, these last, get that last year off my contract. I don't want it. I want, I want you all to pretty much be on eggshells and say, if y'all don't do it my way, I'm not coming back this year. And oh, next year, excuse me. And oh, by the way, if we go through this whole process again and Jordan Love isn't ready, we'll be back at square one. So if you're saying that the Packers have the opportunity to do this same thing all over again and basing it off of the fact that you want Jordan Love to have another year, maybe he's ready, maybe he's not. But why would you not want to have an MVP, three-time MVP, Super Bowl champion quarterback, one of the greatest of all time, That's still on your roster for another two or three years. I would agree with that, Sammy. Freddie, before you pop in, listen, I, the difference between our viewpoints on this or our vantage points on this is I'm taking what he said as what he said, yeah. literal, and I you're you taking at what he said as a, um, a, a tactical play or mm -hmm. a manipulation of the situation. So that's the difference of the vantage point. I'm taking it as he said he didn't want to play this year. You're saying is he said he didn't want to play this year, so hopefully getting out of 2023. Here's the deal with that. Both of you guys made great points, but remember this. Adam Schefter reported that the Green Bay Packers were willing to extend him another two years past the contract that he was already under contract for for another three years. That tells me the Packers didn't have any confidence in Jordan Love or they're hoping and praying that Jordan Love was going to be there. But if he was not ready, at least have Aaron Rodgers on the contract. When Adam Schefter had that report, that told me all I needed to know about the Packers and their negotiating skills, that they need to go to a business class to learn how to negotiate with people. You don't put it out there saying, we're ready to have Jordan Love play, but then a report comes out there saying, we wanted to extend Aaron Rodgers and make him the highest paid player in football. That's not negotiating 101. You get an F in negotiations when you come to the Green Bay Packers. Either way, if the Packers win the Super Bowl, everybody's going to benefit. Aaron Rodgers can still walk in there like Vince McMahon and Conor McGregor with his Super Bowl championship, and the Packers get another the title but this was the art of negotiation and in my opinion Aaron Rodgers won this negotiating battle because he got what he wanted but the Packers want to be in the benefit of that if he leaves in the Super Bowl then everybody benefits real quick before you jump in here Sam Dan I just want to ask you this so now that you figured where you guys are differing here you're taking Aaron at face value are you being swayed by what Sam and Freddie are saying do you no, feel like this all. was his I, plan all along? Not at all. I know I uh, offer an apology to their general manager, Brian Gutekunst, because I was like, what are you doing, dude? And a lot of us were like, man, he's lost control of this situation. And again, I think the challenge of a general manager is to live in the now and mm -hmm. the future. And he gets to do both. He gets to have his cake and eat it too. Like, again, he was the guy that traded up for Jordan Love. And their hope, the ideal situation when it comes to that draft pick is we can sit him for at least two years and he can learn and we don't have to rush because he's a developmental project. We don't have to rush him on the field. They get to do that while also contending for a Super Bowl, being led by the MVP for two seasons. Like, that is the... That is, that is a utopia for a general manager. I think it's a home run for Green Bay still. I can understand Sim's uh, vantage point. I disagree yeah. with it because it's an assumption, and I'm taking him at his word. All right, Sam, take us so on. So, Dan, Dan, 
Dan, check me out. So, so, so I got my MBA from the number one international business school UConn. in the world. I've taken negotiate, not UConn, not even close. I've taken <laughs> negotiation classes. I've been Be in nice. negotiations. I've been in negotiations with ownership. I've also been in negotiations with ownership and Aaron Rodgers at the exact same time. I know how this guy plays his game, and it's a really good game. He likes winning on the football field and off of it. Aaron Rodgers won the game that he played by getting exactly what he wanted one more year with his guys bringing the band back together for this last dance. All right. Better than he did this time a year ago. Roethlisberger had a normal offseason for the first time since his season-ending elbow surgery in 2019. He felt the effects of it Thursday at the Steelers' first training camp practice, saying, my arm feels really, really good. Steelers assistant coach Terrell Austin had some praise for Ben's arm as well. Throws that were typical Ben throws. He still got an arm. There's no issue with that. Freddie Coleman. Is Ben's arm good enough to lead Pittsburgh to the playoffs? In my opinion, yeah, it's good enough. But I don't think the team around him is good enough to get into the playoffs because mm. people, seem to for, people seem to forget that last year when they were undefeated, he was making those anticipation throws, those accuracy throws in that short passing offense and still making those intermediate throws. So I've never had any question about the arm strength of Ben Roethlisberger. But, Dan, you know this. If you don't have a competent running game, there's only so much you can do just throwing the ball over the place and not being a two-fisted attack. But I've never had any questions about the arms of Ben Roethlisberger. I mean, this guy stands in the pocket. He takes that punishment. But more than ever before, he gets rid of the ball on time. He gets the ball to the receivers in great positions where they're not going to get killed over the middle by safeties, not going to get killed over the middle by cornerbacks and linebackers dropping in the coverage. His ability still to put the ball exactly as an on-target passer, I never had any questions about that. I question have the Steelers made enough around him in terms of a running game and that offensive line that is not the same what it used to be. But the arm strength question is not a question with me. He has more than enough arm strength and arm accuracy to get the Steelers in the playoffs. I don't think he has a team around him that can do Hold that up. regarding that arm Freddie, strength. Freddie, let me ask you this. Will he be one of the seven teams? Will they be one of the seven teams to make it to the playoffs? Here, right now, I, I'm going to say no because I still think Baltimore and Cleveland making that division. I think three teams out of the AFC East are going to get in when it comes to Miami, New England, and also Buffalo. So they could have a good season, but nine or ten wins and a loaded AFC may not be enough for Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers to get in the playoffs. I think two come out of the AFC North in Baltimore and Cleveland, but I think three come out of the AFC East in Buffalo, New England, and Miami. Okay. Yeah, Freddie, I mean – I'm with you, but I'm not really with you. So Big Ben's arm, so yes, you're not Big with Ben me. has the arm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not. I'm trying to listen to what you're saying, but I'm kind of like, ah, it's not adding up, right? Last year, we saw three teams from the AFC North make the playoffs. Last year, we saw the Pittsburgh Steelers play 11-0, and and then obviously they struggled towards the end. So Big Ben, yes, has the arm. The question is the offensive line, and, and I understand Correct. the offensive line is porous. They were the 31st-ranked offensive line in the NFL last year. So they go, Pittsburgh goes and drafts Najee Harris, who essentially was one of the best players in college football. Some people would say he was the best player at Alabama, and that's saying a lot. I would have said that. And so they get a running back. Maybe that's up the running game. But they also have a top three defense in the NFL. And so it's not really about Big Ben's arm, though he does have the arm. It's about their defense. It's about the running attack. And hopefully they can make some uh, improvements along the offensive line. So what's the answer, Acho? Is it yes or no? Do you think yeah. they're, they're Absolutely the... yes. Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. I said yes. He has the arm to lead the Steelers to the playoffs. He has, they have the defense. Uh, he's a, another year removed from elbow surgery, so you know what it's like to be injured at quarterback and have to play through it. He, he has the arm, without a doubt, and the Steelers will be in the playoffs, just like last year, which is exactly what I said. The Steelers will not be in the playoffs, and it won't be because Big Ben is not good enough. Last year, Big Ben threw for 33 touchdowns and 10 picks still. If you actually go back to his last two starts of last season, he threw for 850 yards and seven touchdowns. Go to the Colts game. He was unbelievable in that game. So Big Ben is still good enough, but he's not good enough to pull this team to the playoffs. That's the difference. The surrounding aspects of this football team need to be the pull, and he needs to get carried as a supplemental piece. He's no longer Big Ben from five, six years ago that can carry a football team. It is all about the offensive line. Three new starters are going to be incredibly difficult to replace when it comes to their average or below average performance level. I understand the defense is great, but at the end of the day, you are going to need to protect the quarterback and have some form of a run game. Give me a good O-line over a great running back. 
they don't have a good old line in Pittsburgh. And I'm trying to figure out this whole offseason what this offense actually is going to look like. Because last year they masked a lot of their issues. Catch the ball, get it out. Catch the ball, get it out. And that covered up for the bad offensive line. You can't do that anymore because that's how you went on your losing streak to end the season is everyone figured you out. I look at this as a fringe playoff team, but really like the eight or nine team. I agree, three in the AFC could get at AFC East. I think two from the AFC North. I think two from the AFC South. Yep. And I think two from the AFC West are better football teams than Pittsburgh. And so I look at Big Ben going, okay, you're good enough. But you can't carry them. You can't carry this football team. You've thrown these last two seasons as a starter healthy, 77 touchdowns. So there's no like issue of, wait, the, the quarterback's not good enough. Is our offensive line good enough? Yep. Is our backs good enough? Yep. Skill position good? Yep. Yep. That's not the case in Pittsburgh. He checks the box. The offensive line doesn't. Yeah, I mean, my only, my only pushback is this. We're all high on Miami is what it sounds like from you, Dan and Freddie. Mm -hmm. Yet last year in this same scenario, fringe playoff teams, who made the playoffs? The Pittsburgh Steelers, even though they were a fringe playoff team. Sometimes you have to base your experience off, off – really base your success off of experience. So Mike Tomlin has experience in the playoffs. The Pittsburgh Steelers, Ben Roethlisberger, has experience in the playoffs. He knows how to win when it counts. And, yes, I understand they went on a losing streak, but they won when it counts. Talk about those last two starts. The Pittsburgh Steelers know how to win when it counts, and I always put that experience and that culture over a team like the Miami Dolphins, who y'all are talking about they are going to make the seventh seed in the playoffs. I put Pittsburgh over Miami, and that's why I have them as the third team in the AFC North to make the playoffs. Well, if you, you would be right, Sam, if they had the offensive line for the Miami Dolphins. Correct. Now, I completely agree with you. That Miami Dolphins offensive line is much better than Pittsburgh's right now. Mm. Tua Tungabailo is going to have a full training camp where he's really going to get used to playing with that offense. And also the Titans, Gasicki is really, really good for the Miami Dolphins. They got an underrated defense. They have less questions. If you were five years ago, to Dan's point and Sam, to your point, five years ago, if they had questions in Pittsburgh, then Ben Roethlisberger is great enough to overcome those questions. Now he's not great enough to overcome those kind of questions as an aging quarterback. That's not an indictment on him. That's just the reality of the situation. Five years ago, three offensive linemen not being there. Ben Roethlisberger is great enough to do that. Now, uh-uh-uh. That's what I'm thinking. Miami Dolphins, a lot better than the offensive line, and I'm going to trust that they're going to be able to learn from their mistakes that they made down the stretch when they were a potential playoff team in the AFC East, and they were not able to do that. You want to use the word experience? They're, in my opinion, they're going to learn from that experience of not mm -hmm. making the playoffs that's going to benefit them to get into playoffs this year and keep Pittsburgh out. Yeah, but, but they had that, all these questions. That Molly, real quick, they had all these questions last year, and they answered them by making the playoffs. Bro, that was last year, so year like Sam. Ach, Ach, that was, that you're was 2020. Telling me that you think the Steelers are going to be better than the Colts? You nope. think they're going to be better than the Chargers, and you think nope. they're going to be better than the Miami Dolphins? All three of those teams. To I get think in. they're better than Miami. You don't have to be better than all three to make the playoffs. Yeah, you, you don't. don't. You don't. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you, no, do. you don't. Yeah, you this year, yeah, 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 you do this year. Look at last yeah, year. Business do. school. Look at last year. I'm not, I'm not looking at last year. I'm looking at this year. It's a 17 game season Where and did an extra playoff team. School? I'm not going to play revisionist history, Sam. It's this year that we're talking about, not last year. That was last year was then. This year is now with Pittsburgh. Go ahead, Acho. Make your humble brag. I went to the Thunderbird School of Global Management. The number one in the international business school in the world, what people from the all world? around the world. I know we're going to get to this in a little bit. People from all around the world come to this school to get their education. Dan, okay. UConn, eh. It's I actually okay. went I get to, it. Right. I went to Catholic school as a kid, and we were the St. Lawrence Thunderbirds. So, same place. <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. I'll just leave you guys with this. Um, speaking of the O-line, they did lose Pouncey and Villanueva. Mm. That is the Steelers on the O-line this Good season. Point. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be Googling that school. Still to come on first take, <laughs> all eyes on deck. Let's go Big Blue. You know what it is. Uh, looking at the ads in the NFC East, Caesars William Hill has Dallas as the favorite to win the division with Washington right behind. Dallas missed the postseason in consecutive seasons for the first time since 2013. It's time for uh, Cam Takes here where we go around the NFL. Freddie, you are up first, sir. Who's going to win the NFC East? As a Dallas Cowboys fan, it pains me to say this, but it's going to be the Washington football team because that defense, they got a bunch of filthy dudes. You got Chase Young, you got John Bostic, a linebacker. I love the fact they drafted Jamin Davis out of Kentucky. He can be that Swiss Army knife for that defense. They have the best coach in the division in Ron Rivera, and I trust that Ryan Fitzpatrick will be more Fitz magic than Fitz tragic that we've seen from him in his NFL career. And he's <laughs> exactly heard right. That. Fitz tragic, that's good. <laughs> well, believe me, as a guy who played for the New York Jets, and when he did that, he's had those kind of moments where he can look like a world 
world beater, and a lot other times like the world is beating him down. But now he's around a coach of Ron Rivera that's going to say, I want you to be Ryan Fitzpatrick, but play within the confines of the offense. we got a solid running game. we got underrated guys on the outside, and trust our defense can make some plays. Believe me, they have less questions in the NFC least than anybody else, even at the quarterback position. But because he's in that situation and they're asking not to screw it up and just play the game right like he's supposed to, I trust that Washington will win this division. Man, nine games could be a runaway in this division. They're going to get nine to ten wins, and I think when it's all said and done, they win the NFC League. Yeah, I'm going with the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm not a Cowboys fan, and I'm not even really a Cowboys supporter. That's the crazy thing about this. I haven't cheered on the Cowboys in years, even though I grew up in Dallas. But the reason I'm going with the Dallas Cowboys is twofold. Number one, Dak Prescott's going to come back a lot more motivated. We all saw what he did in his first four games and some change last year, averaging over 370 yards on offense, nine touchdowns. Then we all saw what happened when, when he wasn't there. It was all bad. So Dak's coming back. He's more motivated. He's going to lead really well. So all that said, we could talk about C.D. Lamb. We could talk about Michael Gallup. Talk about a motivated Ezekiel Elliott. We could talk about all that stuff. But what I really want to talk about, my second point, is the fact that this defense actually will be good. Right, the last their new defensive coordinator, Dan Quinn, the last time he was a defensive coordinator in 2013 and 2014, back when he was with Seattle, they had the number one rated defense. You know who the Cowboys uh, defensive coordinator was last year, Mike Nolan? They had the 28th ranked defense. So the defense will be better. Yes, it will take time, but I'm going with the Cowboys. I still love Washington. I'm high on the Washington football team. Anyone who watches knows that. But I think the Washington football team will make it challenging, but Dallas will win the division. Man, you are just like your brother. You are just like your brother. I watched we, we, you we look good, last we week. sound good. I watched you on television last week say that you believe the Washington football team was the most equipped or best equipped to knock off the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Absolutely. And now you're picking the Cowboys Absolutely. to win the division? It's like, Absolutely. How, how can they be a team that is good enough to knock off the defending Super Bowl champion, but they can't win the division? Like, I don't understand. So you're going to have to explain that one to me. My pick is Washington. <laughs> it has been Washington since April. I think this is the best defense in football. You, Freddie, you mentioned Davis, the addition out of Kentucky. It's great. It's also William Jackson coming over as a corner from Cincinnati. This will be the best defense in football. I think their offensive line is much better than people think. They kept Scherf. They drafted Cosme in the second round. That's a huge addition. I actually think this is going to be the fastest or one of the fastest offenses in football. Terry McLaurin is a bona fide one. Curtis Samuel is absolutely juice. Gibson as a tailback is a fantastic player. And I think De'Ami Brown, their third round pick out of North Carolina at wide receiver, is going to have tremendous impact for their offense. And everyone goes, well, what are you going to get with Fitz? I would say this, the best versions of Ryan Fitzpatrick are always attached to when he's playing with a good defense. Why? Because he plays a YOLO style of football. It's like, yeah, I'm just going to be ultra aggressive. Sometimes the ball gets put in harm's way more than you want, creates turnovers. What does a great defense do when the ball gets turned over? It doesn't hurt your football team. They get the ball right back or get off the field quickly. That's why he plays so well in that style with a good defense. I like Washington. I think the Giants, if Daniel Jones takes a huge step forward, are going to be good. I have a different viewpoint in the division than other people. I think it's going to be a good division. Now to the Cowboys. Stop talking to me about their defense. They have the second highest paid quarterback, the second highest paid running back, the fourth highest paid wide receiver. They have another first round pick at wide receiver. They have the second highest paid guard and a top 10 paid offensive line. I don't care if the defense is 30th. I don't care. You should win the division with that. I don't like stop building in excuses for their offensive players. I don't think this defense is going to be that much better than they were last year. Demarcus Lawrence has to be the best player on the field. And other than that, find me a truly dependable, impactful player on their defense, Acho. I got you, Dan. First and foremost, so you've been high on Washington since April. I've been high on Washington since last year but before the season the started. But yeah, win to win the division. I said they win the division they last year, division. number one. Number two, number two, Big Dan, Big Dan. Hold on, check, check me out real quick. You said I'm just like my brother, switch and takes, all the things. You can win the division and also not win the Super Bowl. You could lose the division, be second, make the playoffs, and be a better matchup for a certain team. All the reasons that you just said, which are all the reasons I believe, right, talking about Deron Payne, Chase Young, every reason you just said, scary Terry McLaurin, is the reason why the Washington football team will challenge Tampa Bay, right? But that's a matchup. 
It's a matchup, right? Tampa Bay's defense is solid. Washington's defense is solid. Tampa Bay's offense, obviously extraordinary, right? Washington can slow that down. So you can lose your division. Look at the New York football giants like you talk about all the time. Right. You can lose your division and still go and win the Super Bowl. It's, it's, it's yeah. possible. Stuff happens. So it's about matchups. The question was... Earlier, Washington, are they best matched up to beat Tampa Bay? And I believe they are. It's a matchup. But who can win the division? I think Dallas can, not for the reasons you named. Yes, the offense is good, but I've been around good defensive coordinators. I've been about around bad ones and good ones. And I've seen them take Chicago Bears 2014, right? We had the, they, not even we, they, because I wasn't even on the team then, had the 31st ranked defense. Actually, 32nd. The year before, 2013, they were 31st. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, 2015 rolls around. Vic we Fangio. bring in this guy named Vic F Bingo, Vic Fangio, my coach. I played under Vic for four years. We went from 32 to 17. No, we weren't number one that next year. But, you know, the next year, we went 17 to 11, and then nine, and then we were number one. And so, yes, there will be a drastic jump. It didn't take superstars. We didn't have superstars back in 2015 and 16. We built that. So the Dallas Cowboys defense will be better. That's not an excuse. I'm not a Dallas Cowboys defender by any means. Right. I think they will win the division. I think it'll be tight. But I also think that Washington is very well suited to compete with Tampa Bay because of its of a matchup. That's the only reason. The, the pushback I would have with the defensive aspect is Vic runs a completely different scheme, and I don't want to get too nerdy on first take, a completely different scheme. Dan Let's Quinn's get nerdy, scheme, Dan. Let's get Dan, nerdy. You know Dan Quinn's scheme is, is cover three, right? What's mm -hmm. the most important yes. aspect of that to be good? What's the most good. important aspect? You need big corners. You need good corners. And you need safety. a pass rush. Pass rushers. You need <laughs> pass rush. You mentioned his defense in Seattle. He ain't got Cliff Averill. He ain't got Michael Bennett. Down mm -hmm. in Dallas. He ain't got those dudes. Yeah. That's what made yeah. that defense dominant, okay? So while the scheme is going to be simplified and allow them to play faster, you will get absolutely gutted in the NFL playing cover three without a pass rush nowadays. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get back to my Giants. I mean, this is fun talking about Washington, the Cowboys, all this stuff. But uh, there's this guy, Joe Judge, over there who I believe in. I want your thought. I want all of you to weigh in on this. I was doing the show last week with Bart Scott. He came on. He thinks the Giants are going to win the division. He actually said he thinks Daniel Dimes is more athletic than Dak Prescott. Freddie, uh, why no love for the Giants? Well, I would love for the Giants. I mean, I hear what he's saying about Daniel Jones being more athletic than Dak Prescott. You can make a case for that. I think the Giants, Joe Judge, is the right coach for them. I just don't trust that Daniel Jones is going to make that jump up that you're going to need, especially Saquon Barkley coming back from injury after that torn ACL. Joe Judge can coach. There's no doubt about that. But that's asking a lot for a guy in Daniel Jones. Well, let's be honest. The Giants are hoping and praying that he works out well because if he doesn't, guess who's going to pay for that? It's going to be Dave Gettleman, the general manager, because he's the one that drafted this guy when people said, okay, why are you drafting him that high? Has he had his moments? There's no doubt about that. But you got to have consistency. Dan Orlovsky says it all the time. You can be a great quarterback, but if you're inconsistent great quarterback, there's only so much you can do. We've seen Daniel Jones make plays here and there. Then we've seen him just drop the ball with nobody around him. If he's able to fix that, then the Giants are going to be a player potentially in this division. But it's all riding on him. And right now, I still don't trust that as athletic as he can be on the football field, can he make those kind of plays? Can they trust him to make those kind of plays? And if they don't trust him to make those kind of plays, then it's going to be a long season once again for the New York football Giants. What is our yeah, quarterback I, Oh, go ahead, Yeah, Dan. I have – oh, Dan, no, no, Dan, you got it. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Dak Prescott is more athletic than Daniel Jones because at the end of the day, if your athleticism doesn't help you in moments of panic, then there's no point in having that athleticism. And Dak doesn't panic with the football nearly as much as Daniel Jones panics with the football. I think the Giants are going to be very good. Molly, I'll keep it a buck with you. If you told me that Daniel Jones had Kellen Moore, Dak's play caller, or Scott Turner, the play caller in Washington, mm -hmm. I would feel significantly better about their football team. But I get stuck on Jason. And, Garrett, and I get stuck on the stagnant style of football that they play. And I have said they need to push the ball down the middle of the field more this year. He doesn't do that traditionally. I hope he does. They better use a lot more motion this year. He doesn't do that traditionally. And they need to. I think that Daniel Jones is good. But with an average play caller and a good quarterback, your offense is only going to go so far. It's a good football team, and I would not be shocked if they won the division, but they're going to have to show both play call and quarterback that they're somebody different than they have been. I Dan, I love, the you. Jason I love you. I love you. Yeah, Dan's the guy who talks about how, how great Washington is and how he's been high on Washington. Now you're not shocked if the New York football giants win the division. That makes no sense to me. I don't think New York has a chance. I'm not high on Joe Judge. Like you, Dan, I'm not high on Jason Garrett. 
I'm not high on Jason Garrett at all. And yes, Daniel Jones, I think he could be a great quarterback, but he needs better coaches. It's as simple as that. We just talked about Vic Fangio and what he did for a bad defense in Chicago. Coaching changes everything, especially when they're good. And so, no, I don't see how the New York Giants could win the division. You said you wouldn't be surprised. That sounds good. That, that actually yeah. sounds a lot like some people that we both know. <laughs> but, real, but real quick, I'm with down on this one because that's, that, that everybody in this division has questions. Yeah, that's I, why anybody right. can win this division out of the Giants or Washington or Dallas. Who can answer their best questions will decide who's going to win this division. I don't think he's off base by saying that he wouldn't be surprised the Giants win. Yeah. We're not talking about world beaters in the NFC East here no, it's outside of New York Giants. Grabs. And I, I also think the, the Giants are going to be good, bro. Like, they got a really, really good defense. If their Talk offensive line plays, like, good football, Gollin, we'll Tony, both those tight ends, Saquon mm-hmm. back. Like Daniel Jones doesn't have to be awesome. He just not has just has to not panic ten snaps this season, and they yeah. will be good. That defense is going to be that defense will be pretty good. Yep. way better than your yep. Cowboys. Yep. Right. Two words, two words, two words, yeah. two words, Molly. And then we're going to Jason break. Garrett. Yep. Jason yeah. Garrett. Two, two words for Cowboys fans: Dan Quinn. <laughs> Oh, I like Dan Quinn. What you mean? I don't trust Dan Quinn. Y'all don't trust Dan Quinn. Go look at about, the stats. Go look at the stats. That's all. Don't listen to me. I, I, I don't Dan, trust Dan. Dan, uh, you're tapping yeah. out for one segment, and then you'll be back with us. Uh, we've <laughs> only been talking about whether Rodgers would return to Green Bay since late April. And guess what, y'all? We found. 22 years old, an Olympic rookie in his first Olympic Games ever in his country, Slovenia's first appearance as well. He put on a clinic, 48 points, tied for the second highest total in men's basketball history in the games to lead Slovenia to a 118-100 victory over Argentina. He put up 31 in the first half alone. Argentina's head coach, Sergio Hernandez, has seen enough to declare this. Quote for me, I said this two years ago, he's the best player in the world, including the NBA. And if there was any doubt in my mind, there is no doubt anymore. He is the best player in the world. All right. Speaking of incredible international players, Freddie, I'll start with you on this one. Would you rather build a team around Luka or Giannis? Ooh. I'm going to build around Giannis, and that's no disrespect to Luka Doncic, who I believe is only going to get better. But you can say the same thing about Giannis Antetokounmpo, and not just because he won the NBA championship, but look how he was able to do it. Not just building up his team and having Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez, also Bobby Portis Jr. stepping up their games. But look what he's able to do in the finals. Just seemed like each and every game, whatever you took away from him, he had an answer for the problem when it comes to the Phoenix Suns. When you're making free throws like he did in game six and making one three-point shot, people are losing their minds. I just look at a guy like Giannis, and it's not to say that guys don't want to play with Luka, but because he's less temperamental than Luka. Luka has a lot of diva inside of him, and he's already run off one coach in Dallas. You have to wonder how much of, of an effect that's going to have in the Dallas Mavericks going forward. You look at Luka, Luka Giannis, excuse me, he's not running off anybody. Guys are saying, you know what, playing in Milwaukee may not be a bad idea if that guy is going to be there. That kind of organizational structure is going to be there based on Giannis. So as great as Luka is, I'd rather build a team around Giannis because you don't have to worry about your superstar having that kind of diva too that Luka has that could really separate a team, and that's something to be afraid of. Hey, Freddie, if uh, if Luka's a diva, I want diva, right? Luka, he has pizzazz. He has flash. And, and trust me, I'm a huge Giannis fan. We all saw what Giannis did. But Luke and they were both, yes, they were both first team all NBA the last two years. So really, it's you can, it's either or. But Luke just has this flash to him, this pizzazz. He put up 48 just yesterday. This dude just has a special kind of player where you will you you bring everybody around the world to come and watch Luca play. Not to say you're not gonna win championships with 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 Giannis. I know you will. But Luca just has that fan factor as well. If I'm building a team, yes, I want to win championships, but I also want to sell tickets. And I think Luca's gonna sell more tickets than Giannis just because the flash and the fun that he has while he's playing the game. Oh, I, see, I disagree with that because Giannis has flash as well. And also, by the way, at least Giannis has won a playoff series. Luka hasn't done that yet. And Giannis was able to take the Milwaukee Bucks from really the ground up and build them into a, what turned out to be a championship basketball team. But to say that Giannis doesn't have any flash, did you not see the plays he made in the NBA Finals at both ends of the floor? Ask the Andre Aiden about the flash of Giannis Antetokounmpo when he got stuffed on a dunk attempt in Game 3 that completely changed the series for the Milwaukee 
Milwaukee Bucks. Ask DeAndre Aiden of the Phoenix Suns how he got his soul taken away from him by Giannis Antetokounmpo, especially in Game 6. There's plenty of flash around when it comes to Giannis, and not for nothing. Giannis after winning a championship, you go to Chick-fil-A and ask for a 50-piece, not 49, not 51, but a 50-piece, and the ladies are sure no problem. That's pretty <laughs> good flash for me from Giannis Antetokounmpo. His flash game may not be as noteworthy so far as Luka, but to say he doesn't have any flash, he has a lot more flash than I think anybody wants to give him credit for, especially going to make that comparison between Giannis on one side and Luka Doncic on the other side. Luka's 22. Luka's 22. And I understand Giannis is young, well, young as well, right? 26, 27. Luka's 22. So to say he hasn't led his team yet, he's only had two years, right? Give this man some time and he's already putting up amazing numbers. And so he, Giannis is phenomenal, right? Like, trust me, I'm Nigerian, right? So I, I respect and love Giannis more than probably anybody else out here. But Luka, when I'm building a team, I just like what he does on the court, off the court, in the community, and I know Giannis does it as well. Like I said, you can pick either one, and you're going to win either way. But when yeah. I just want if I'm trying to sell tickets I'm, I'm, as well, because I think about building a team, selling tickets, running a team, I'm picking Luka. I, I hear you on that one, but remember this with Luka. Here's the one thing I'm concerned about when it comes to what you say about the flash and having the game and having the personality. There's no doubt about that. But those technical fouls, at a certain point, you can go from being a guy that people like to saying, okay, Luca, why are you complaining all the time? Why it seems like you're trying to get underneath people's skin? And I think he's going to learn that with maturity. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But at 22 years of age, he still has a long way to go to grow up. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Freddy. But, yeah. but I look at a guy like Giannis building around him where he can do so many yeah. different things, a Swiss Army knife. I'll take that guy right now with Luca Doncic, just despite the age. All right, Freddie, sorry to jump you there, but I, I have a question for you, and I need a yes or no answer because we have to go. Would mm -hmm. you still feel this way if Giannis didn't win the chip this year? Because I'm not trying to take anything away from it, but there was a lot of major injuries and a lot of big superstars that he didn't have to deal with, Lakers, Nets, et cetera. I can go on and on. So if he had not won the chip, would you still be going with him over Luca? Yeah, I still would be going with him over, over Luca because for this reason, when he was out in Game 5 and Game 6, his team had his back. When he was injured against the Atlanta Hawks in the Game 5 and Game 6 Eastern Conference Finals, they say, hey, we got you, boss. We're going to take care of things. You are a great player and a great person when your team does not just take a step back when you're not going to be there. The fact they were able to raise their game and get them to the NBA Finals, and then he said, I got you guys. I got one leg out here. I'm going to be peg leg baits, but I'm going to lead the way. I still feel the same way if they had not won a championship because guys are gravitating towards Giannis, and guys okay. will gravitate towards Luka. But right now, even if they did not win a championship, guys wanted to play with Luka. Drew Holly wanted to be traded to Milwaukee because he wanted to play with Giannis because he was not going to pass up on that opportunity. Yeah, right. Freddie, you make a good point. You're talking about leadership, right? Level four and level five leadership, right? Level four leadership is when you lead your team and you're the dominant player, but then you leave and everybody falls off. You're talking about this new level of leadership, level five leadership, where even when you're gone, you've done so much on, to affect your team that everyone else around you plays better. And we saw that with Giannis. But I'm still picking Luka. I don't think he's a diva. I don't think he's a distraction. I think he's got that kind of that Steph Curry kind of flash, the fun, where people from all around the world will come to watch him play. Yeah, yeah he's not a, a distraction. He, yeah, Luka's not a distraction. But that diva thing, uh, look out for that. Keep an eye on that. All right. Let me work on my level five leadership and get us to bump on time. <laughs> Aaron, I think, I think level five was good, right? Aaron Rodgers, after all that, will supposedly return to the Packers after all of that hoopla. So who's the biggest loser here? Is it the Packers or Rodgers? Dan Orlovsky has plenty more to say on that. Buckle up, y'all. Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson took the league by storm after entering the NFL winning Super Bowl 48 in just his second year as a starter and almost repeating a year later. Since then, he's been one of the NFL's top quarterbacks. He's got the most total touchdowns and second most wins as a starting quarterback since the 2015 season. But that success for Wilson hasn't translated to deep postseason sex success for Seattle. Uh, since losing to the Patriots in Super Bowl 49, the Seahawks have not made it past the divisional round. Wilson told Complex Magazine, that he is ready to get back. Well, I think the next thing is I really want to go win the Super Bowl. I want to play the best football in my life. I'm all in, so I'm excited about where we're going, what we're doing, and the next 10 years. They better watch out. I'm ready. Acho, will Wilson ever win another Super Bowl in his career? 
No, he won't. And the reason why is threefold. Last I checked, I love how Dan's getting a little antsy. This is what I live for. Last I checked, it's still Tom Brady's league. He's not going anywhere. And oh, by the way, Patrick Mahomes is still a great quarterback in the NFL. And oh, by the way, after those two guys kind of fade off, it's still going to be Justin Herbert's league. Last point. Uh, Dan, you talk a lot about that vaunted defense of Seattle and all those dogs they had on the inside and on the interior and back on the deep end. People would argue that some of those Super Bowls were really because of the Legion of Boom and, and Marshawn Lynch. And so, no offense, I love Russell Wilson. I think he's a great quarterback. But will he win another Super Bowl is the question that we've been asked. And you have to look at who he's competing against. Tampa Bay, uh, Aaron Rodgers is back again in the mix. There are great quarterbacks out there with, around, with great teams around them. And I think those are the teams you're going to see competing more than Seattle. Of last year, okay? And I love Herbert, and I think he's going to win a Super Bowl one day. But we can't say after one year this is his league over Russell Wilson's. I'll look at the NFC because I'll look at, like, the path to get to the Super Bowl. Tom Brady's still there, yes, but I think Tom's going to play for two more years. I don't envision Tom playing longer than two or three more years. So you're looking at, okay, that path is going to get cleared. And then Aaron Rodgers looks like he's going to be out of the NFC in likely one year. That path is cleared. Matt Ryan probably out of Atlanta in the next year or two. That path is cleared. Matthew Stafford, we'll see how it works out with the Los Angeles Rams. That path may be cleared. So then you go to like the next tier of quarterbacks that Russell Wilson is going to have to lead his team team passed in the NFC to get to the Super Bowl for the chance to win it. By the way, my answer is yes. Russell Wilson will win a Super Bowl in the next 10 years or, or ever again. So then I look at the next crew and it's like, okay, Dak Prescott. Obviously, questions attached to Dak Prescott and his ability to go take a team to the Super Bowl. Kyler Murray, still unproven, both him and his head coach. Um, Trey Lance, I think Trey Lance could be the biggest threat long-term to Russell with a, a detachment to Kyle Shanahan. Maybe Jalen Hurts or Sam Darnold, like still. So, like, what guy over the next eight years in that conference are you sitting there and going, give me him over Russell Wilson? Like, what guy over that period of time? Because at the, at, at like, at, at the, in the big Big picture, I, you, you have to look at it in totality. It has to be general manager, has to be head coach, and has to be roster, and then quarterback. And he doesn't, he can't count for one out of 53. But there's not a quarterback that I think I'm taking out of that top tier over Russell Wilson. I love Joe Burrow. I love Justin Herbert. I think they're going to be absolute rock stars in this league. But I think Russell Wilson wins one again because there's no bona fide Patrick, Lamar, Herbert, Joe, like young rock star in the NFL, NFC outside of baby potentially Kyler that I look as a huge hump for him to get back to the Super Bowl. I actually think this year they have his most talented football team offensively that he's ever had. That's going to be a good offense. I think the speed at the skill position wise with their addition of Eskridge out of Western Michigan as a wide receiver is tremendous. Gerald Everett is going to be a huge addition as tight end. And the big thing for me offensively is they finally have a scheme that they don't need to be so dependent on Russell being stupid good. Like they have a scheme that is going to allow Russell to just kind of play a little bit of pedestrian boring quarterback at times and then you could go be a star. We don't need you to be a star star for just for our offense to be functional you can take us from really good to dominant offense so I think they've got a really good football team this year but I definitely see him winning a Super Bowl in the next eight to ten years absolutely I'm gonna say no because Dan you make a great point in terms of how the team had to change they had to go a little bit back into the past and still let him cook to do his thing at quarterback for Seattle but it is so tough to win a playoff game much less one playoff game then another then another and then a Super Bowl and you look at what he's going to have to deal with with that kind of pressure. He wants that pressure. He's welcoming that pressure trying to win another Super Bowl championship. But you have to have so many different things go your way. And yeah. how many times have we seen that, hey, their championship window is large? We said that about Seattle when they first made that run. We said this could be like the Cowboys in the 90s or the Pages early 2000s. How many championships does he have? He just has one championship. Brett Favre, oh, when he first won his Super Bowl, this is going to be the start of so many Super Bowl wins for Brett Favre. How many does he have? <laughs> one championship. Aaron Rodgers, when he finally won his championship, man, this is going to be a run. One championship. Good point. It is so difficult in the National Football League because the NFL is no longer year to year, guys. You guys know this. Hold it's on, second Freddie. to second. It is second to second because Freddie, we don't let me know jump in it, here. Go ahead. I, I got to challenge you for a second. Okay. So Russell Wilson is mm -hmm. 32 years old. Mm -hmm. Tom Brady's 43 years old.
Mm -hmm. I think we're glossing over the fact that he said the next 10 Correct. years. He might 10. not even be with Seattle. That would be 11 years if we're talking Tom Brady. And we know yeah. Russell Wilson has that same kind of discipline and takes care of his body. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't but, understand why but, this is really even a question. We're, we have a decade. Yeah, right. but Molly, here's the deal. Good point. You, we, we can't put Tom Brady in the same category as anybody because what he's done is never going to be done ever again in the National Football League. A guy, we may be lucky to see a quarterback win three Super Bowl championships, and that guy could probably be Patrick Mahomes. So but we we're can, not asking him to be Tom Brady. We're just asking him to win, win one, one more, more ring, I, and I, I we're talking it, but, about the, lo the longevity. Molly, I get it, but in the NFL, you know, you know what beats longevity when it comes to players? Winning a championship and trying to do it over and over again. The streets are littered with quarterbacks who never won one championship. Dan Fouts, Warren Moon, Dan Marino. It is incredibly hard just to get to the playoffs more than ever before in the National Football League. And then you add that pressure of being a quarterback with Russell Wilson, who already has one championship, but wants to win one to say that I was able to lead the team to the championship. It wasn't the Legion of Boom helping me. It wasn't the running game helping me. I was able to be the guy leading that charge. That's incredibly difficult to do in a regular season, much less a championship. That's why I'm not liking his chances. I'm not saying he's never going to win a Super Bowl or, or get to a Super Bowl. My gut tells me that he's not going to win another one because the NFL is a second-by-second -second league, and it changes each and every year. He could have a great team now, or potential great team now, but next year, injuries could happen, free agency defections, the whole nine yards, and then he's starting all over again because the NFL is a second-by-second -second league. Yeah, initially, initially, Dan and Molly, I was like you both. I said, you know what, 10 years, it's a long time, 8 to 10, give it to him. But then you really start thinking, and Tom Brady specifically, because that's, that's a good point. Russell Wilson may not stay in Seattle to go and win. But think about what Tom Brady had to go and win. It wasn't just a given that he won. Tom Brady walked into the perfect situation. He walked into a team that was literally Super Bowl ready. They were literally yeah. verbatim a quarterback away. Their defense was the number one defense in the NFL. Their offensive line was strong and ready. They drafted a first-round offensive lineman. I was yeah. in the building, Dan. They literally were talking about, bro, we're a quarterback away. And then they got the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Tom Brady. So we can't just assume that if you're a great quarterback and you switch teams, you're automatically going to win. Now, yes, it's happened. I understand. Peyton Manning went to, went to Denver, won a Super Bowl. But you can't just assume it's just going to happen like that. And so eight to ten years, initially you say, okay, maybe give it to him. But then you know. actually start looking at that list. Looking I at that list. Not just going to the Super Bowl, but winning. Winning uh, a Super Dan. Bowl. Tampa Bay hadn't been to the playoffs in 12 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, and they had Bruce Arians. They had Bruce Arians, who's been to the playoffs, who knows what it takes to win, and they were a quarterback away, and they got their quarterback, and they won. Go watch All the right. game. But we remember have a hard this. out here. Yeah, oh, Tampa Bay was 7-5. Freddie, last word. Yep. Tampa Bay yep. was 7-5, and, and people were questioning if they are going to get to the playoffs, and they went on a great run. Nobody was easy. questioning yeah. that. Absolutely. Nobody was questioning All right, that. We're yeah, all 7-5, yeah, they were. Uh, still to come on first, just let Russ cook, would you? Uh, Cam <laughs> Newton. Let's get it. It's Madden Ratings Reveal Week at ESPN all week. We're helping unveil the highly debated player ratings in Madden NFL 22. Today, we're breaking down the top 10 interior defensive linemen. Take a look at the list. Marinate on this. Uh, for the fifth time, three-time Defensive Player of the Year Aaron Donald is part of the 99 Club. The Eagles, Fletcher Cox is second at 94. Chris Jones, DeForest Buckner, Cameron Hayward round out the top five. To break it down, we bring in a familiar face, former five-time Pro Bowl defensive tackle turned Madden ratings adjuster Vince Wilfork. Vince, thank you so much for being with us. Good to see you. How you guys doing? It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Let's get right into it. I want to start with Aaron Donald. He comes in with a 99 rating. How dominant is he, Vince? He's five points higher than the next player in Fletcher Cox. I mean, he, he hands down, that's, that's accurate. I mean, to do what he do uh, in the inside, um, and as long as he's been doing it since he came into the league, is unbelievable. So... That rating, that 99, if they had 100, he should have been 100 because it ain't too many people out there doing what he do. And I don't think we'll see that for a good while as well. Hey, Vince, this is Sam Macho. Hey, who do you think is the next player who can reach that 99 level on the interior D-line? Who? Um, I don't think they, they, they're still in college probably or high school. <laughs> um, I don't think wow. we'll see that within the next five, six years. Um, because what Aaron Donald has done is, is is unheard of. I mean, he put up numbers. He do things as if he was a defensive end. So uh, from the inside, um, you have some great guys in the inside now, but they towards the last part of the towards the end of their career, 
Um, so their prime is behind them. So I don't see anybody up and coming that can do it. But uh, you have a couple that probably can get to 97. But 99, I don't think we'll see it until probably another five, six, seven years. I know you don't like to talk about yourself. You were never that kind of player to do that. But in Vince Wilfork's prime, <laughs> what rating would Vince Wilfork have given Vince Wilfork? I'd have gave Vince Wilfork a 99. <laughs> I mean, of course I'll give myself a 99. Are you kidding me? Why wouldn't I? I mean, come on now. <laughs> but uh, realistically, I, I think I'm think I'm power somewhere around a 96, 97, realistically. Okay. 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 Uh, <laughs> let's get to your former teammate. Or uh, you know what? I, I don't want to go to Tom Brady yet. I want to talk about Aaron Rodgers because that's the major story of the day. Vince, what right. are your thoughts on all of this in terms of he's now has arrived to camp. He's in Green Bay. You know about the standoff that's been going on for months. Who do you think actually won? Was it the Packers or was it Aaron? I think both of them won. I mean, I don't think Aaron would have showed up if he didn't like um, the terms. And I think the organization realized that the franchise of this team and, and one of the faces of the NFL needs to be be home, which is at Green Bay. And so I think both parties and both sides won that battle. So uh, now they can kind of put it behind them and actually get the, get, you know, get the season on the way with training camp and all that stuff. So I think it's good for football, not only just for football, but I think it's good for the Green Bay and the Packers fans. So, Vince, we got Tom Brady going back to Foxborough in week four. You obviously played in Foxborough. You played with Tom Brady. What do you think that environment is going to look like in that week four matchup? I think it's going to be a home game feeling for him. Um, I really do. I think mm. the fans are going to welcome him with open arms. Um, I think he's going to be embraced because of so much he's done for that organization. And, you know, Tom is Tom, you know. A New England Patriot or a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, um, he's Tom, and and people love Tom and people hate Tom. But he's going to a place where he won a lot of football games. He started the Super Bowl runs, and I really think they're going to open him, uh, welcome him with open arms. I really do. I'm with you in terms of the home field advantage because you don't play in a place for 20 years and people just forget about you because you've been gone for two seasons. Nah. But in the present, though, no. this Brady team, they got all 22 back vents on offense and defense. They are clearly the choice, in mm -hmm. my opinion, in NFC to get back. You know about repeating. What are the, your thoughts on the Buccaneers and Brady repeating and now he has a second Super Bowl championship with his second team? Well, Tom, you know, they did something that we all expect would happen this year you know uh, for him to go down for the first season and for those guys to win the Super Bowl uh, it was that's that's really unheard of I mean it just goes to show you the type of uh, team he had and, and the coaching staff and Bruce that he had and they all put it together um, it's going to be a little harder this year just because of you have to deal with injuries now now because coming off a Super Bowl run and then you can't do things the same you know because right. You play the longer season. You have to deal with offseason a little differently. You got to get guys' body back. So I think the key part of them getting back is injuries. I think if they keep the injuries down, I think they'll be right back knocking at the door this year. Absolutely mm -hmm. they will. All right, Joel. Let's have a little fun right now. So before we let you go, Vince, I need you to take a look at this. We all remember the overalls from Hard Knocks with the Texans. <laughs> you being you, pure sexiness right there. So we're going to show you a few training camp looks. We dug them up through the years, and you're going to give us a Madden rating, 1 through 99. And obviously, Sam and Freddie, I want you in on this. This is all fun. So first up, guys, 2019 Chiefs camp fullback Anthony Sherman wearing his patriotic fit can we pull that one up wow yeah that happened that happened let's just let it breathe for a second um what rating are we giving that vince <laughs> we're gonna get out of 94. <laughs> okay where are you I i'll tell you if i had a body like that i'd wear that outfit too i'm giving him a 98. <laughs> oh yeah and Sherman's my guy I played with him in Arizona I'm gonna give him a 93 on this one I like the look I like the look 93 oh my gosh all right um let's keep it going I have no comment 2010 Broncos <laughs> oh, really? camp quarterback Tim Tebow now Tim had a special rookie haircut uh Barbara lined him up nice what's our rating Vince uh 97 <laughs> 
<laughs> Way too nice, Acho. <laughs> oh, I'm going 76. 76. That's not a barber who lined him up. That's a, that's a, 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 a mean teammate. A mean teammate who did that to him. 76 all the way on the haircut. <laughs> How can you do that to Captain America of college football, Tim Tebow? That's the nerve to do that to somebody <laughs> like that. But, Sam, you gave him a, se oh, you gave him a 76. I'm going to give him a, a 50 because that's half and half haircut right there <laughs> with somebody doing that to Tim Tebow. That is wrong for so I was, many levels. I was nice. I was nice. Yeah, too nice, too nice. All right, so here's the last one we got. This is 2017, different direction. Steelers training camp, A.B., all Gucci suit. Now, this is to training camp in a custom Rolls Royce with a chauffeur. Vince, talk to me. You got, I got to, I got to go 100. He, he's off the chart. 100. He's off the chart. <laughs> okay. He's 100. He's 100. All right. Freddie? <laughs> I'm with Vince on this one. It's one thing to show the training camp all gucci out, but then you show with a valet that opens the door for you. Much respect to Antonio Brown. That's going back to the old days where he was like a gentleman of the town having a valet and a chauffeur-driven car. I'm with Vince on that one. He gets 100 from me. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, and, and that's and that's more than a valet. He got the whole chauffeur. He got he got the Batman and Alfred. Like that's ninety nine. If I if 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 Aaron Donald's a ninety nine, that's ninety nine. I can't give him a hundred and not give Aaron Donald a hundred. Come on now. <laughs> true. Right. True. Can, true. Can I point. see my favorite outfit one more time? Can you guys do that for me? I need to see the overalls. Just one one last time. We need to see them. And Vince, I got to tell you the truth. During the pandemic, I actually went to Old Navy and bought a pair of overalls. I did. I love it. My job was done. <laughs> <laughs> I, lear I learned from the best. All right, Vince, appreciate you. Thank Absolutely. you so much for the time. Okay. Uh, tune in Thank all week guys. to Sports Center NFL Live for exclusive ratings reveals. Plus, every day here on First Take, we'll be joined by a familiar face tomorrow. Former All Pro running back Marshawn Lynch joins the show to break down the game's top running backs. It's Madden Ratings Reveal Week all across ESPN. Still to come on First Take, the latest news to a strong start before the star quarterback had a season derailed by COVID. Kim never looked the same after returning to the team last season, leading the Patriots to draft Mac Jones with the 14th overall pick in April. Here's Lewis Riddick on the Patriots quarterback situation. Lou? There's a reason why Bill sat and waited for Mac Jones. Does he give this football team the best chance to score points, protect the football, not be the reason that they lose game, but contribute to the reasons why they win games? If he does that, he'll be the starter week one. And I think, for me, it's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time before they put him in there. Sam Acho, uh, will Cam be the Patriots starter for the entire season? Cam won't be the starter for the entire season, but it's not because of Mac Jones. I love what Lewis said. Uh, the, the Patriots sat and waited for Mac Jones. They didn't trade up. They weren't eager. You saw the Chicago Bears trade up for Justin Fields. They were desperate where New England wasn't. I think, I think that the only issue I have with Cam Newton is that he's been injured the last few years. He said it himself. His last healthy season was that 2016-2017 season. He hasn't really looked himself, so he will start. But I believe an extra game in the season, an injury may happen. You may see Mac Jones step in there, but it's not going to be Mac Jones' job for long. Cam will get it back. I think he plays all 17 games because the offensive line is going to be a little bit better. And think of the free agent signings they made in the offseason when it comes to John Smith and Hunter Henry at tight end. You also got Bourne and Nelson Aguilar, wide receiver. He's going to have more weapons than he had last year. And all those defensive guys coming back, all that pressure, it's not going to be on him. But I think the biggest significance that I think he's going to play a full 17 games and lead the pages of the playoffs is that having that full training camp and a little bit of preseason football to have more reps. Remember, before he had that injury last year or he was slowed down last year, he was in a great rhythm until COVID-19 happened, and then he had to miss a couple of games. A couple of teammates had to miss a couple of games due to contact tracing. Now that that team, wherever that vaccination protocol is, I, I firmly believe the page is going to make sure everybody's going to be on the same page. This is an organization that does not leave any I undotted, any T uncrossed. So I think because of that and having another year being in that system and having better personnel around him, I think it's more likely to me that he plays a full 17 games. He won't have to do everything like he did in Carolina. Carolina. But I think because of having that year and having better personnel, I think that's going to be a benefit to Cam Newton playing a 17-game full season in a regular season. 
well, part of what makes Cam so great is his physical style of playing. He's 6'5", 230 something, 240. He's a big, fast, and physical football player. He's also a really, really good quarterback. So part of what makes him this dual threat is that you can use him and run the ball. You can use him not just to throw, uh, throw the ball, but to run it, right? They would run quarterback powers for him in Carolina. They would do the same thing, quarterback sweeps for him even last year in New England. And so if you've got a guy who's big and strong and fast and physical and he can't really do what he used to do when it comes to lowering that shoulder and getting those extra yards, that's what I think is going to keep Cam Newton from playing an entire 17 games. Now, I think I don't think he's going to be out for so long, but the question is, will he start the entire 17 games? He hasn't done that in three or four years since we talked about 2016, 2017 when he was healthy. You've seen a 14 games here. You've seen two games there. You've seen a lower uh, 15 games here. I don't think that Cam is going to start every game, but not because of Mac Jones or anyone else. I think it's because the way he plays the game. What makes him so great is his physical style of playing, and he can't be as physical as he used to be because of his injuries. I think that's why he's going to play 17 games, Sam, based on what you just said, that he won't have to be as physical as he used to be the Carolina Panthers because even though they ran the quarterback power a lot last year, New England Patriots, they really instruct him to say, when you get the first out, just get down. Inside the one-yard line, he's going to be that power guy. But if you're the New England Patriots, the best way for him to be that powerful guy is to make sure he doesn't have to do it as much as he used to when he was a younger man, the Carolina Panthers. And I think he's going to be well-versed in that with the Patriots and their coaching staff saying, Cam, we need you out there for 17 games the best way to have you out there, don't try to prove how tough you are. We already know that. They're going to change his style just a little bit and adapt and make sure he can tweak it and understand that getting three, third and five, get six yards and get down. Third and four, get eight yards and get out of bounds. That's going to be a benefit to him and a benefit to the Patriots with him staying upright for 17 games. Yeah, uh, Cam posted a QBR 47 last season. Worst of his career, obviously. This year will be much better no matter what. Oklahoma and Texas, gentlemen, have formally notified the SEC that they are seeking an invitation for membership. That's beginning July 1st, 2025, according to a joint statement from the flagship programs of the Big 12. According to the release, OU and Texas sent SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey their request this morning. Acho, what do you make of this? Yeah, this is just a formality. I don't think Texas or OU are going to wait until 2025 to join the SEC. This is just a formality. You sign a paper, hey, we're going to wait until 2025, but they're going to find a way to buy their way out of their contractual obligations and join the SEC sooner rather than later. Why? There are TV deals that are coming up. There's a lot of money in TV. So the sooner uh, that Texas and OU can get into the SEC, the bigger the pie will be. You're looking at John Robinson, who's probably going to be a Heisman favorite already. You're looking at other games that Texas has played, right? Texas needs to get to the SEC for more money and also for better recruiting. A lot of the top recruits are leaving the state of Texas, going to LSU and going to Alabama, really going all over the SEC. But now if you put Texas and Oklahoma in the SEC, now all of a sudden you can tell recruits they don't have to go anywhere. They can play the best and they can stay at home. Texas or OU will not wait until 2025 to join the SEC. Well, number one, I'm surprised a Longhorn grad used the word sooner in any kind of a maybe sooner because that's when the new rights deal will kick in with ABC, ESPN, ESPN2 having SEC football. And there's a path with Texas and Oklahoma. I read an article about this on CBSSports.com that the path could be for the SEC to have $1.3 billion in revenue based on Oklahoma and Texas being in their conference. You're not going to want to wait for that money until 2025 when the rights deal will kick in about 2024. So I'm with you. It's a mere formality. We knew this was going to happen. The minute it was reported last week, I said, hey, gone. There's no way they're staying in the Big 12. And I go back to this. If the Big 12 had a network the way we see from the Big 10, the Pac-12, and definitely the SEC network, maybe we're not having this conversation. But when you're the biggest, baddest boy in the jungle when it comes to athletics and money, people want to be where you're at. And don't think for one second this will be the last two teams defecting from a conference to go to the SEC. I suspect another two teams, maybe one from the ACC like Florida State and somewhere else, will be SEC members by the time 2025 rolls around. 
the real question here is, and, I, and I, Freddie, I hear what you're saying, but the real question is, what happens to the rest of the Big 12? I mean, Iowa State is a contender in the Big 12. They're talking about maybe going to the Big 10. Kansas is as well. What happens to the rest of that league? That's my question. I'm a Texas alum. I went to the University of Texas. As an alum, I'm saying, okay, this is good for us. But what about the rest of the, the league, the rest of the conference? Oklahoma State is extremely upset mm -hmm. with Oklahoma for, for breaking their brotherly bond and leaving. You see Baylor's upset. TCU's upset. What happens to the rest of the Big 12? And I think over the next few days, weeks, and months, we're going to see so much happen. Such a shakeup, not just in the SEC, but also in many different conferences throughout college football. Well, in my opinion, Sam, I think the Big 12 is going to go the way to the dinosaur in the Southwest Conference. I don't think the Big 12 is going to be a conference for the next seven to eight years because, to your point, if you're Iowa State, why would you not go to the Big 10? You already play Iowa anyway. Now they get a chance to be a conference rival. The one I feel sorry, for example, Kansas basketball, because if you're Kansas basketball, they already took Missouri away from you. They went to the SEC. And now the Big 12 is disintegrating before your eyes, where you're not going to have the rivalry with Oklahoma, not having the rivalry with Texas. So I'm with you in terms of what's going to happen to Big 12. Here's my answer. Seven Seven to eight years, there won't be a Big 12 conference. There are going to probably be maybe three or four super conferences where teams are spread everywhere. If you're West Virginia, why do you want to stay in mm -hmm. the Big 12? I would go to the ACC because it's a lot easier geographically. You play Virginia, you play Clemson, you play all those schools, and you don't have to do as much travel from West Virginia going in Big 12 schools. That's where the Big 12 is going. The way of Disco, the way of the Meringue, the way of the Dinosaur, <laughs> and the Southwest Conference, they are not going to be a league seven, eight years, maybe even sooner than that from now. No, that's a great point. All right, guys, another story I want to get to. The Pelicans and Grizzlies are completing a trade to send Jonas Valanciunas to the New Orleans in exchange for Eric Bledsoe and Steven Adams. The Pelicans are trying to build a team around Zion Williamson, who is rumored to be unhappy with some of the team's moves this offseason. The Grizzlies are looking to add more weapons to go along with John Morant, who led the team to the playoffs this past season. So here's a look right now at how John and Zion have compared throughout their careers take a look at that right there and freddie uh who will win a title first is it zion or ja i believe it's going to be zion but it's not going to be in new orleans because if you're making noise already after two years in new orleans that you're not happy with things whether that's something that's coming from outside of zion or inside of zion that means he's always already got his eye looking at the landscape of the nba maybe he thinks about the new york knicks or somewhere else and i love john moran guys will want to play with him in memphis he could potentially be a Giannis onto the kumpo situation in memphis what we've seen with Giannis been able to do the milwaukee bucks not saying win a championship but be enough of a piece that guys want to play with you same thing with trey young with the atlanta hawks but if zion williamson is going to win a championship i believe he can do it but it's just not going to be in new orleans i think he already has his eye on somewhere else and he may know where his next landing spot is going to be that makes it more likely joining a potential super team or better situation in New Orleans makes it more feasible to me that he wins an NBA championship before Ja Morant does down to Memphis. Yeah, I think Ja wins a championship first, and not only because he's talented, uh, not only because he went to the playoffs last year and beat the Golden State Warriors in the play-in tournament, uh, not only because of that, but also because of their head coach, Taylor Jenkins. So Taylor Jenkins got a chance to learn under the coach of the year over in uh, uh, the the, the, the Giannis's team, right? The Bucks, who just the Bucks, won the, the, Bucks, the yeah. championship, right? Like, so Taylor Jenkins, number one, like he's a phenomenal coach. Everyone who goes and coach and plays under him, number one, they get better. Number two, this is a shout out for Dan Orlovsky. Dude went to my high school. This dude's a phenomenal nice. coach. Went to my high school, St. Mark's School of Texas, and he knows how to coach. So sometimes, sometimes it's not just about the players around you; it's about the coaches and about the culture. And I think yeah. that's why John Morant will win before Zion Williamson. Uh, to your point, John Morant, to me, Sam, is in a better situation because the Memphis structure and the Memphis coaching staff is better with, with, with the New Orleans Pelicans right now, although I think they made a really good hire bringing in Willie Green, a former assistant of the Phoenix Suns. Mm -hmm. I think it's better for the NBA if John Morant stays in Memphis, and, and also you have uh, my man Zion staying in New Orleans, but I live on planet Earth. I know that's probably not going to happen with Zion Williamson. Mm. Finally, this wild story. So we know the Jags drafted Trevor Lawrence with the first overall pick in the draft. Most would assume that means Lawrence will be the starter. Well, Gardner Minshew isn't ready to give that up just yet. He's focused on competing for that starting job. Maybe a little too focused. Minshew had this to say on the Green Light podcast with Chris Long. In preparation for the competition, I haven't taken a leap in weeks. That's not an option for me. Number two is not an option.
Okay, my mother would refer to that as potty talk. Acho, uh, what's your reaction to Minshew's comments? He's holding things in. He's holding things in, and I, I mean, obviously we know that Trevor Lawrence is going to start in Jacksonville, but Gardner, Gardner's got this kind of bravado about him. He's funny. He's got the social media presence, right? He do, he's got the mustache, the mullet. So I respect what he's saying. Obviously, I don't think he's going to start. I don't think anyone thinks he's going to start 